Okay, thank you for joining today's webinar. This is one in a series of webinars on planning for sustainable financing uh, in preparation for the pandemic fund around two applications. Uh, today's session will focus on resource mapping and mobilization. My name is Melinda Frost. I'm the unit head for learning solutions and WHO's um, learning and, and WHO's health emergencies program. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, if we could please ask you to share uh, your name and where you're from in the chat function today. It really helps us to be able to understand who is joining into these webinars and um, just where you're from and, and what your interests are. If you have any questions throughout today's program, please, please go ahead and put that in the Q&A function uh, in your Zoom at the probably the bottom of your screen. We won't be taking live questions, so if you have a question that you need to have answered, please enter it into the Q&A function. We will be sharing out all the slides, the recording of the, this webinar, and all of the webinars in the series, uh, as well as any tools that are mentioned throughout this the entire series, and um, frequently asked questions as well. So with that, um, today's session is really focusing in on resource mapping and mobilization. The purpose of the entire webinar series is to assist countries in development of success, successful national plans or proposals for sustainable financing with a particular focus on the pandemic fund's second, um, second call for proposals. The specific objectives for this session today is to identify opportunities for co-financing and co-investment and resource mobilization in the development of country plans and proposals. It's also to demonstrate the utilization of costed plans to inform resource mapping and mobilization in your, in your plans and proposals and outline the investor landscape for one health approach that in alignment with the health sector. So with that, uh, we'll be joined today by three different presenters. First, we'll be hearing from Andrea Luciani, who's uh, from WHO's Regional Office for Africa. He's the External Relations and Partnerships Team Lead. Next, we'll hear from Ludi Siriantoro, who's the unit head here at WHO Headquarters for Multisectoral Engagement for Health Security. And last but very not least, we'll hear from Katrin Taylor from our partnering organization, who's a program officer in partnerships and one Health for the Food and Agricultural Organization. So please, again, if you have questions, um, enter them in the Q&A function. We'll hear from Andrea and Ludi, and we'll go to a section of questions, then um, Katrin and a section of questions as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andrea. And uh, good afternoon and good morning to colleagues connected. I will uh, move forward to share my screen so that we can go into the presentation. Um, yes, thank you so much. Just give me one minute. In the meanwhile, um, just let me introduce my name is uh, kindly uh, already mentioned is Andrea Luciani and I work in the WHO Regional Office for Africa in uh, Brazzaville, currently based in Brazzaville. So very nice to have you all here. So my presentation is going to be uh, focused on co-financing and co-investment, a bit to unpack uh, the definition of both and what is meant like by um, the pandemic fund, uh, and I think it's very complementary with the intervention of the other speakers, and I hope you'll find it useful because I see uh, that uh, for the pandemic fund, this is a key uh, important aspect of the um, of each proposal that they are going to support and each proposal that they receive. But at the same time, I said there is a bit of confusion sometimes between the two and also how to really make them stand out in your uh, different proposals. So what is the scope of uh, co-financing and co-investment? We need to look at this from the perspective of the pandemic fund itself. As the words say, it is a fund. So one of the scope of the fund and of this pool funding that exist at the global level within the pandemic fund is really to be a multiplier of resources and an enabler of resources. So in their perspective, 
co-financing and co-investment, they really seek to bring new and additional resources to the different projects that they are uh, that they are um, financing. So it's either new resources that are uh, currently like not uh, yet awarded or not yet in place, or is it like uh, resources that are in place and are really complementary and in line with what the pandemic fund uh, would like to um, to uh, fund. What is the difference between the two in the definition uh, of uh, the pandemic fund? So first of all, in terms of co-financing, okay, both of them, um, they also include financial resources, but specifically the co-financing is really 100% focused on the financial resources that are required from implementing entities, which are the 13 that you are all aware from the pandemic fund of which WHO and our sister agency, FAO, who is present in the call, are also part. Bilateral donors, philanthropies, private sector, any other sources, okay, that within your project are in line or can be used to complement either activities of your project, so really to fund components that are part of your project that are not directly funded by the pandemic fund, or are uh, in line and complementary with your project. So adding on top of what the proposal that you're uh, putting forward is going to cover. Whereas the co-investment, okay, it has, a, it has a new aspect compared to the co-financing, which is first of all, a non-monetary aspect. So it's looking also at policy level, the co-investment, and it's all especially looking like, I would say more having read the guidelines and having studied a bit how the framework of the pandemic fund is uh, focused, is mostly focused on domestic uh, resource mobilization. So the co-investment is more a commitment, uh, not really only uh, financial, mostly I would say from the national government of the countries where you uh, are uh, um, looking forward to implement your project in terms of policy or other types of actions that are um, that are required to implement the project of the pandemic fund. So let me uh, now move forward to, uh, first of all, how this is evaluated by the pandemic fund. So we try to unpack uh, a bit more those definition. First of all, I just wanted to draw your attention that out of the total score of the pandemic fund for the evaluation, you have 15% that goes to co-financing, co-investment and overall available funding. Again, as you can see, it's quite high, 15% out of the total. And this is really because the pandemic fund looks forward for your proposals to be a multiplier of their funding. Ultimately, they need to be able to say for each dollar I invested in this proposal, I've been able to multiply and mobilize to X amount of dollar. And this is a way for them to look like really what to fund. So what is considered co-financing? I'm taking example of previous proposal that have won. Um, as I said, it's basically linkages to existing or new donors. So to either existing funding or new funding that is coming. And I would say um, in these donors, we can include, as I said, bilateral donors. You can see an example here from OFDA. Of course, the numbers are... Uh, um, are not uh, realistic, but I just wanted to give you an example of what is possible to put. As you know, the co-financing and the co-investment, they need to be inserted in an annex uh, table when submitting your proposals for the pandemic fund. So here I'm replicating the same structure. And as you can see, um, here there are two examples, one from OFDA uh, and the second one from uh, um, the World Bank. So in this case, for example, you can describe how, how much the funding is available. In this case, let's say there are two uh, type of funding that are already awarded at the country level. And you can say that, for example, some uh, salary of people that are uh, uh, included in the pandemic fund proposal are covered by this uh, stream of funding, by this specific project. You are required to say what is the time frame, the time frame specifically of that project and which type of uh, activities, supplies, for example, or other things, that type of funding is covering. I'm now like looking at a couple of uh, like key questions that the pandemic fund as a um, technical advisory group looks at when evaluating co-financing, okay? 
So this would give you an idea of how you need to represent it within your proposal. So one of the key questions, for example, is whether you the breakdown of the co-financing co commitment is clearly indicated in the proposal. So how much indeed details have you been able to provide to solidly put forward the co-financing that you have at country level? Secondly, for example, does the proposal bring co-financing that would be mobilized from implementing entities to complement the pandemic fund grant? As you know, implementing entities not only have the responsibility to manage the fund of the pandemic fund, but also to be further resource mobilizers. So implementing entities are also multilateral development banks like African Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank, um, the World Bank itself, for example. Um, and so I would strongly encourage you to work with these actors at the country level and at the regional level, of course, to be able to represent um, the correct co-financing within your proposal as all these actors, first of all, already have like big investments in those regions and in these countries, and also are able to further contribute to what you're putting forward uh, for your proposal. So as you can see also, there are another couple of questions. It's really how much co-financing in US dollar term? What is the ratio? So really the pandemic fund is looking at the multiplier for each dollar that they are going to invest in your proposal. And here I'm, I'm just like summarizing a bit of the opportunities that you should look at, really maybe uh, work with the World Bank and other uh, multilateral development banks, look at bilateral donors. And I would say, look at the European, um, union delegations at the country level, because we've, we're have we seeing, for example, in the Africa region, a, far, a big interest of the European Union as one of the biggest donors to the pandemic fund to be able to synergize the resources that they're investing in the health sector uh, with, with the ones of the pandemic fund so that there is a coordinated approach. Now on the co-investment instead, what can we look at uh, in terms of co-investment. Here, I'm putting also other examples that are drawn from proposals that I've won uh, last year, specifically in the Africa region, for example. So, um, as I said, policy commitments are important, but also um, possibilities to mobilize um, to mobilize resources at the domestic level. So as you can see, for example, in the last line, uh, you can represent even policy at the national level that are in line uh, and have a budget with the ones, uh, with the interventions of the pandemic fund. At the same time, for example, if there is if there are interventions in infrastructure, for example, that's one of my suggestions that could be relevant for the implementation of the project of the pandemic fund, why not why not uh, representing them as co-investment from the domestic uh, counterpart, from the national counterpart, as we have, uh, of course, we are looking at strengthening health systems as an overall and preparedness. So having, for example, those infrastructure in place is also something that uh, can be represented as co-investment. And again, what are what is the pandemic fund looking at co-investment uh, within the proposal? So uh, are they also looking at how, um, how the co-investment is represented in the proposal? But also, is there a clear plan for financial and policy co-investment? So on top of the funding that is uh, provided by the pandemic fund, what is the national plan you know, to implement this funding also through strengthened policy in the relevant areas that the pandemic fund project is addressing? So, um, and, and as you can see, are also like how these plans are in line with the implementation of the project. So all these questions are part of what the pandemic fund looks at in evaluating co-investment and as opportunities, uh, to conclude on the co-investment, of course, there are um, the possibility of indicating all government plans, okay, for the development of different policies. I would strongly encourage you to include this in the narrative of the different proposal. And also, as I said, the rehabilitation, reconstruction, or infrastructures that are maybe not directly linked with your project of the pandemic fund, but as an overall, okay, since they are intervening in the health system where the project is going to take place, 
uh, and being implemented, they add value to the project in terms of strengthening its sustainability in the long term. So in a nutshell, not to be too long, uh, we covered like quickly what are the di really uh, different aspects of the co-financing. And remember, like it's mostly financial resources from existing and new donors. And it's mostly uh, focused directly on the project, while the co-investment is more focused on the domestic resource mobilization. It has a policy aspect and it looks uh, also on other parts of the of uh, the health system that can add to the sustainability of your project. So having said so, I would leave the floor back to the moderator and just as a suggestion, anytime uh, you're representing in a project proposal to be sure to be success, keep it simple, keep it clean and make it realistic. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Andrea. That's very simple messages, very lean. <laughs> Thank you for wrapping that up in such an easy way. Appreciate your time. Um, so just as a reminder, if you have any questions, we won't be taking live questions on air today. I see somebody's hand up. Please, if you have a question, go ahead and enter it into the Q&A function. And if you haven't had a chance yet as a participant, please um, tell us who you are and where you're from, and you can enter that into the chat function. Thanks so much. Thanks, Andrea. So we'll be moving on to our next presenter, Ludi Surian Toro from uh, WHO, to hear more about how costed plans can be used to inform resource mapping and mobilization in your plans and proposals. Thanks, Ludi. Thank you, Melinda. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. And thank you for uh, joining this webinar. I'm pleased to be here to present you the uh, resource mapping tool and the, uh, the, 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 the tool that, we can that can help you to identify resources. Next, please. So uh, the WHO resource mapping tool and processes is support in overall the country preparedness. It is, um, um, you know, this tool can help you to track and coordinate domestic and international resources, complement to what Lu uh, Andrea has mentioned, uh, you know, uh, both available or upcoming to, the, to, to support the national preparedness. It is provide a clear picture about the overall resources, not only just within the Ministry of Health, but it's other ministry. As you know, that health security is not owned, you know, exclusively by Ministry of Health, but many different entity whole government approach in terms of implementing their health security preparedness and response. It is also provide a tool for the donors to do uh, more alignment and a clear picture on who's doing what, what and where and how much has been invested in the country. And then most importantly is to, um, to identify critical gaps and needs of which the country can propose further. And also the tool is, is importantly to uh, provide you sustainability after you apply the pandemic fund because most of the pandemic fund, it will be um, um, follow up with the um, sustainability of the country to be able to uh, follow up further in terms of owning it and implementing it for the preparedness capacity and response. Next, please. So the tool has been developed in order to support country journey from risk assessment to planning to develop the national action plan. As you know, this is a process, what we call it the self-assessment process, the joint external evaluation process, the risk vulnerability assessment process, but it's also costed the national plan. The resource mapping is to complement on how the, the national action plan can be mapped out in terms of what is the bilateral funding, what is the multilateral funding, and what is the domestic investment that is currently available in the country. The idea is that the tool can help the policymaker, the implementer, to understand better on what is the actual real gap. Is it the workforce? Is it the financial? Or is it technical expertise? So it's cut across of different needs in terms of what the country and is quite flexible and tailor-made by country to country needs. Next, please. So it is also aligned with the global architecture for health emergency preparedness and response. As you can see here, the HAPA in terms of objective 5.2, coherent and resource uh, uh, at the national level. Um, this is about development of technical and financial resource mobilization plan, including funding proposal. What the resource mapping is usually does at the country level, we bring together all the existing donors, the 
you know, the, the new donor and also technical donor in kind and financial to speak and have a policy dialogue, not only with just Minister of Health, inclusive Minister of Planning, Minister of Finance, and to have a whole government approach to uh, discuss about the implementation of the National Action Plan. So the tool is in the context of HAPA is a tool that can map map out all the available financial and technical requirement for country to progress further and then eventually to own it in the future. Next, please. So this is just to give you a snapshot about what we have done with the tool and how many countries. So it's around more than 20 countries has done uh, the, um, you know, the um, resource mapping uh, workshop in terms of uh, the national action plan around $2 billion um, has been mapped out. So it means that there are so many different implementer and different program is happening in the country. The country is not starting from zero. So we need to have that picture in order to make sure how is complement each other, how the pandemic fund proposal can help the country to progress, but eventually also what is the plan to sustain it in the future, both on the capacity infrastructure needed be or addressing human capital investment so then to allow the country to have a better preparedness and response. So this is just a snapshot in Nigeria. We have nine active members of partners, um, uh, 66 partners, sorry, but six minutes, uh, nine ministry involved in the health security and we map out around 313 million. So uh, this then has to, to, to showcasing in the context of the pandemic fund proposal that it, there is already ongoing activities, but it's not sufficient in order to bring the country to where they would like to go. And the pandemic fund can complement and also strengthen even further in the future for the preparedness and response capacity and capability. Next, please. So give you a snapshot a little bit about how is the dashboard of the tool. This is just to give you a very uh, simple dashboard in terms of the, let's say this country like Sri Lanka, when we costed the national um, action plan, it cost around 75 and 30.3 um, million. And then as you can see that we also mapping in terms of how much is the partner existing and domestic contributions to the NAS, which is 4.9. And we know that there are uh, funding gap that we need to address, although we also already map out that the ongoing bilateral is already uh, you know, around 150, but it's not mapped into the National Action Plan because it's a separate program. It is developed proposal, which is quite uh, uh, different from what the purpose, but the outcome and the objective is the, still the same. So what we can use with the resource mapping is to align those, to make sure that we can have a, a conversation from the existing activities uh, in Sri Lanka to put and support uh, uh, the National Action Plan, increase that in terms of the implementation and acceleration. Next, please. So, um, the resource mapping is really um, uh, inaugural to support the uh, prioritization of the country in order to move forward and progressive forward in terms of the capacity uh, under the International Health Regulation Monitoring Evaluation Framework. Um, so the, the resources that we map is also government and partner investment, as, as I mentioned earlier. It is using the tool that um, provides you the analysis and the gap identification. It is also consensus building between different ministries uh, who are uh, responsible to deliver the plan. It is identified based on the costed plan. So this is an estimation that for the National Action Plan, how much is it going to cost? But it's also most importantly, it is aligned with the one of the criteria for the pandemic fund that we need to showcasing of the cost investment made by other partner, bilateral partner, multilateral partner, or public private that uh, in that matter, such as in Nigeria, we know that there is a lot of public private partnership aligned with the health security outcome. So the resource mapping is inclusivity but it's also providing you a clarity in terms of um, um, flexibility on how the country would like to use it prior to the proposal, during the proposal, but it's most importantly as used, you can use the tool for the future on how you can also uh, further advocate the budgetary and domestic financing using this as an evidence as we have an avenue for a conversation with the parliament and parliamentarian member 
particularly the financing committee in the country. Next, please. So um, in order to uh, make sure that we can support you, we can also provide a very fast track uh, resource mapping options. So uh, the idea is that we need to, um, normally we need to have a, a, a considerable time to map out what is the you know, overall investment that is made from our donor uh, data intelligence that we have in our uh, network of donors and partners already existing many, many years. Uh, in the region, globally or bilaterally. So um, what we can do is that we, you can provide your data gathering uh, made by the country. We can showcasing and then making to, uh, the, the tool ready for you to, to have, uh, to have uh, the discussion and validation. So it is very important to validate. And then from this, you can have the identification of resource mapping in terms of how to use it, distributed data collection as needed to the other ministry if you need it. This is a, a, a good uh, you know, exercise for the cross-sectorality, the whole government approach. And should you need further uh, support technically in using this tool, you can contact us uh, or my colleague, uh, Sean Cokerham here. Next, please. So I would like to emphasize that health security and the reality of the COVID-19 in the past is not only just, uh, you know, the responsibility of Minister of Health. Um, there is a lot of deliverables by different capacity or different technical areas, uh, such as risk communication, such as food safety, you know, point of entry. It requires a very well functioning of cross-sectorality within the government, within the country. So it is important that the resource mapping reflect that. So our process is really looking at the overall, not only just one uh, particular ministry, but the country should define it as this is voluntarily. Uh, it's, as I said, in Nigeria, they identified nine ministries vitally, is vital to address global health security in the country. They can build that proposal, looking at that, what is the gap? And of course, the overall effort is really to support Ministry of Health, identify the bottleneck, but it's also technical uh, uh, gap, but it's also financial and all complement together to have an overall picture of where the country is leading towards in the future. Next, please. So this is my last uh, uh, slide. So basically just to, um, to uh, uh, recap, so it is, um, the tool is engaged cross-sectorality ministry and partners. So we have uh, partners typically health area, but it's also other technical areas. Uh, so for instance, not normally in the non-traditional partners of WHO, but they are providing funding. So it is important to, to, to build that. And then it is informed, the tool is informed to the national plan, but most importantly, complement to the pandemic fund requirement. And then last but not least, we are happy to support you with a fast track of the resource mapping process in terms of how you can build further on what available resources, how to address it in terms of alignment with the other donor, but it's providing policy dialogue and then sustaining what you are proposing under the pandemic fund. With that note, uh, Melinda, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks a lot, Ludi. Very, very informative. informative. Um, so when we take an opportunity to go to some of your questions now, um, so the first question that we have is actually for you, Ludi. Uh, what strategies are employed to identify and address gaps in resource distribution, particularly, particularly in underserved communities or vulnerable populations? So uh, thank you very much, very important. So the resource mapping, as I said, is quite flexible. It is developed to tailor meet the needs of the country. Some country is looking at only at the national level, but the reality on the community, as I said, in the field that is the most vulnerable population at the local level. So in Nigeria, I give you example, we are mapping the resources not only in the capital or in what the hotspot area, but it's also at the local area, at the provincial area. And you can see there is a lot of imbalance of resources, how the resources distributed to the country, to different uh, entity, meaning the local NGOs, the local partners of ministries, and then how it's translated in terms, in terms of activity. So the tool can provide that. Uh, it is all depends on the what the country requirements and needs. Great, thanks a lot. Okay, so we have another question, and Andrea, this one is for you. And thank you. I think you've been answering questions in the in the Q and A function as well. Um, 
Uh, so I'm just wondering if you could answer how do governments and organizations ensure accountability and prevent mismanagement or corruption in the mobilization of pandemic funds? Okay, Th thank you very much, Ninda. Um, I, of course, would refer mostly to WHO since this is our uh, uh, our ballpark in this in this call. But I'm sure our colleague from FAO maybe would want to complement later on. Uh, but of course, so um, in the mobilization of this fund, as you know, uh, this process is a national process and the role of the implementing entity is really to support the country in the management and implementation of the pandemic fund resources. So it's not only uh, a receiver of the resources, but it's also implementing entities have been accredited to be implementing entities in the pandemic fund exactly because of their capacity to be accountable and to manage funds uh, in the, the way that the pandemic fund uh, deems appropriate and the donors, of course, of the pandemic fund deems appropriate. So as you know, in uh, WHO, we have several uh, uh, mechanisms and I will not go too much on the details, but let me just mention that, uh, especially when dealing with different actors at the country level, going beyond national government and going towards, uh, for example, implementing partners in the uh, non-governmental organization or civil society organization, we have what is called a framework of engagement with non-state actors, FENSA, that needs to be applied. So this is uh, a means and a tool, but also a shield to prevent mismanagement of funds in several locations. Um, if you if you want more information, we can, of course, provide to you by email on uh, on uh, the implementation of FENSA, but basically due diligence and risk assessment are provided to all the different implementing partners uh, that WHO works with. And in the, um, if you're, I mean, if you're good and your proposal is evaluated for funding, you will need to undergo an evaluation of all the different partners that will implement uh, the pandemic fund at country level. And this can be done at regional, but also global level. I know, uh, for example, Nana team has worked on a list of uh, partners that we are working already with uh, in the NGO and civil society sector uh, that are uh, you know, deemed to have uh, the right mechanisms in place to be able to implement pandemic fund resources, maybe because they have already worked with WHO, maybe because we've worked with other UN agencies in the past because they have shown capacity at the international level. So, uh, I mean, not to be too long in this uh, response because it's uh, it's an important question. I would say that first of all, rest assured that WHO has got uh, mechanisms to implement and be accountable for the resources. That's why, and the same is, um, for all the implementing entities and that we have also policies and tools in place also for our implementing partners uh, that are, you know, below, let's say, in the chain of uh, uh, the passage of resources for the implementation of the pandemic fund. I hope I'd answer that. It was a big question. <laughs> that was an important question. Thank you for answering that uh, thoroughly. So maybe just a few more questions quickly before we go to our next presenter. Um, Ludi, a question for you. For countries with a remap in place, how can they practically use this for pandemic fund proposals for those and then vice versa for those who do not have a remap, what can um, what others can be considered? Uh, thank you. So for those who are uh, already done the, um, the resource mapping um, exercise in the country, uh, because normally we are we are doing it in the context of the National Action Plan uh, in terms of mobilization of uh, the National Action Plan. But it's complemented, as I said, it's starting a benchmark as a baseline for the country where it started, because, you know, many of um, preparedness uh, activities is not starting from ground zero. Many has been invested in the country bilaterally, multilaterally, regionally, and globally. Different entities, Andrea mentioned from FEO, we track everything what is done in the country. It gives a gravity for the WHO to coordinate in the context of what will be delivered, how it's delivered. So with this baseline, it needs to be renewed, re reviewed again, because um, it could be done like Nigeria, it was uh, 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 one and a half years ago. We need to refresh, but we already have a network. We already have the ongoing focal point. And that then helped them to identify what can we propose 
um, um, how you say, a, a proposal that would complement that what are the existing. So that's one. The second is that for those who are not yet done, we we are happily to do the fast track, uh, but then the data collection is performed by the country itself. So it means that we already have the baseline data, and normally we are contacting um, you know other donors. Uh, like for instance, we are tracking G seven hundred countries that investing bilaterally for um, hundred country implementation of IHR. This is where health security preparedness lies on. And we provide those data, and then we showcasing that this is going to complement the uh, the future uh, pandemic preparedness. But it's also it's not going to stop there, Melinda. After the pandemic fund successfully uh, achieved, then we further advocate to the parliament. We have a process of parliamentary engagement in our end, and usually we are discussing with the domestic financing financing committee of the parliament to make sure there will be a gradual human capital investment, infrastructure development, but it's also capacity building that reflect the distribution from national, subnational to local. So we are complete end to end. Uh, but it's an exercise that needs to be performed. Happy to support if there is more uh, specific question or support for specific country. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Ludi. I'll just ask one, one more quick uh, question to Andre. I think it blends well from uh, Ludi's um, comments as well. How can lessons learned from uh, the mobilization of pandemic funds during the current crisis inform future preparedness and response efforts? So if you could please answer quickly and then we'll move on to our next presenter. Andrea? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think uh, not to repeat also what Ludi said, um, I think uh, I would say that we as a community and institution working on preparedness and response and all this, we need to make the pandemic fund their lessons learned, meaning that like we were waiting for a, a donor or a mechanism to be able to fund this intervention in a coherent, such holistic way. Also with a power, uh, a firepower, if you pass me the term, uh, able, you know, to fund like uh, proposals and projects that were normally like scattered from many different donors and in small amounts. So what I, what we are seeing uh, from the first, you know, year or, or so of implementation in the different countries where pandemic fund projects have been approved and are being implemented is really that the pandemic fund should be the positive lessons learned because it has been able to bring a lot of actors together, not only like different implementing entities. So the different UN agencies, the uh, multilateral development banks, different ministries uh, together. You mentioned, of course, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Finance. So bring together like a true commitment also from the uh, domestic counterpart. Uh, this, I think, should be the lessons learned to have this instrument and a tool uh, to be able to address like preparedness and response in a more holistic way than it was done in the past and with more power, of course, of convening different actors, including, of course, civil society organization and NGOs. Thank you. Right. Yeah, this has presented a new way of doing things, which will hopefully build in the future as we move on. Okay, great. Well, so as we uh, go to our next uh, presenter, I just want to remind everybody that the recording will be available of this and all of the webinar series. I think my colleagues can um, enter in the, the site in which you can locate the recordings later. Um, so with that, I'll move to uh, Katrin uh, Taylor from FAO. Thanks, Katrin. Oh, thanks so much and lovely to be here and uh, partnering in this event. It's so important to, you know, look at these uh, cross-sectoral interactions. And I think FAO and WHO are, are a great example of that in our work at the country level. So I'm Catherine Taylor. Uh, I work on strategic partnerships, particularly for One Health, and also help coordinate FAO's uh, engagement to the pandemic fund. So quite familiar uh, with colleagues here and also uh, with the whole pandemic fund. Um, just maybe then to move on to the slides, if you may. Great. So I wanted to sort of start here because uh, at any level, uh, and of course at the country level, at a national level, there's a certain number of resources. So that's the green sphere, let's say. And as we know that every one of us at country level, or if we come to a country, wants to talk about priorities and where the government should first invest or where a partner might invest. And so 
we tend to then work along key plans that we try to persuade in our different roles, the government to take on board and other investors uh, to come on. And indeed, you know, as somebody said to me once, you know, you imagine yourself going to the Ministry of Finance and trying to persuade for, for yet another policy or yet another plan when already there are many policies and plans on the shelf and many not funded as, as we would like. Um, so we really have to sort of make sense of the plans that exist and enhance the plans that exist. And here I just wanted to give some examples of some of those plans or some of those priorities that are emerging in this world of, of One Health or pandemic PPR. And as was said uh, by Andreas, indeed, what often happens is, is we need to start with the government uh, budget and the government investment to prove that they're really champions of the cause and then start looking outwards as was said by Ludi, at all these different sources that can come in and support the planning. But the ownership really does rest um, with the national stakeholders and particularly uh, the government. So there's some examples of, of some priorities and even some examples of, of some of the sources that are available uh, more internationally. So next slide, thanks. Uh, in terms of One Health, I think you're all very familiar, but uh, the One Health Joint Plan of Action was released uh, very recently in 2022. Um, and basically, that is a, a construct between uh, each of our organizations, including UNEP and WOA, really looking at the internet connect between animals, plants, humans, and the environment. And there are six action tracks. I'm not going to belabor the, the technical details, but immediately and as was said uh, earlier there are many things we have in common that we need to work together uh, through a cross-sectoral approach so next slide in terms of then where can we get the funding and the financing <clears throat> and here i differentiate funding from financing is that we've heard through the the sdg dialogue and indeed the addis ababa and and subsequent discussions that really we have to move from funding to finance. The challenge for us as UN is to really make the funding we receive catalytic. And the challenge for countries is to ensure that the national budgets plus other forms of finance, be they loans or grants, really then move into a, a larger financial landscape because we can mobilize thousands, millions or billions, and the billions really rest in the bigger financial landscape with the government and, and the banks as discussed. So here's a little bit of a categorization that we've done with the quadripartite of what kinds of sources we might look for, of course, starting with the government, uh, looking also at national development banks, looking at uh, not only the the US, um, the basically the the money contributions, but also the in kind, and then the bilaterals and the internationals and the multi development banks, and then these more innovative uh, forms of finance, which are which are challenging to create, but can be created at different levels as well as public private partnerships, which I think. Uh, together we can explore uh, more of. And I know that the pandemic fund um, wants to do that. And then of course, you've got the vertical fund, which is where we find the pandemic fund among others. So the next slide. So when we look at the vertical funds, uh, the, the pandemic fund is of course the new vertical fund on the block. Uh, and we've heard a lot about that, but there are other funds where let's say a one health angle um, really does come into play. And the Jeff and the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, we're seeing increasing lens on One Health. And that's where we can also share maybe resources and work more together. Then, of course, the big global initiatives, those are, of course, implementing entities to the pandemic fund, but they often share uh, a role in co financing and co investment. So I think the very important thing here is when we look at the $1 that was asked for through the pandemic fund, how many dollars will it leverage? And on average, it leveraged six in the last round. So how are these other institutions or partners, co-investors, I, I tend to like the term better than donors, how are these co-investors, if you like, um, actually adding up the, the maths? So those are some, some vertical funds, uh, maybe with the next slide. And other mechanisms, I, I'm not going into all the details of the bubbles explained earlier, but of course there are all the uh, multilateral and the regional development banks. We're seeing them come around very uh, much uh, on the pandemic fund. And I think that's been an excellent um, 
result, uh, a ready result that's to come out of the first round where we're partnering more as UN agencies with the banks. And then, of course, we've got our more traditional bilateral resource partners that happen to be, you know, in many different forms and also have if you like their money in different pots, they'll be funding the pandemic fund, they'll be funding uh, the banks, they'll be also giving bilateral uh, aid and also funding the UN. So we need to also join the dots there because it's a it's sort of a, a milliard constellation of, of different actors uh, with different parts in different pots. And I think coordination around pandemic preparedness and to show that we're better uh, using money and more efficiently is another uh, element that we want to look at. So this is the landscape. This is the beginning of a landscape analysis. And uh, as FAO, we've actually profiled each of these to sort of find out more how we can access and engage together with uh, WHO and quadripartite partners. OK, next slide. So just a quick one on PPPs, private sector partnership, uh, public partnership uh, opportunities. Um, I think this is an area, we probably need a whole webinar on this, but uh, ultimately we need to explore it more, I think, in all of our organizations. Um, we in FAO tend to do this in the sort of ag value chain domain where we bring the actors together and we facilitate and we backstop that relation building and de-risk the investment. So we don't per se manage funds. We might bring in some bilateral to help, but ultimately it's a negotiation between uh, the government and, and the private sector. So that, here's, a, here's a definition that I, I thought was helpful from the European Investment Bank. And uh, it's all about transferring certain risks between the government and private sector and trying to get, to, trying to get better value outcomes. I'm sure it's all been said, if we as the UN work more like the private sector, we might be more efficient in part. But this is, of course, the whole issue is where can you get the best out of the private sector and the best out of government institutions? So next slide. So there's there's two types. And again, you can imagine what this might be in healthcare, animal healthcare, etc. But we don't need to go into great detail. But I think it's something to begin to actually explore and maybe even pilot as, as part of pandemic fund proposals, that dialogue phase of seeing with the government where you might employ a user pay approach. You, the toll roads are the biggest example. You'll have plenty of examples in, in health or the government pay structure, uh, of course, where that might come into laboratory um, uh, infrastructure, etc. So I think that's something to explore and IFC uh, as also an implementing entity, the HAT Fund are very interested in, in going down this, this road. And of course, that uh, is large amounts of money and has a, a large footprint in terms of um, result and impact. OK, next slide. So very quickly, um, what does resource mobilization take or what does investment leverage take? Well, we, whether we're looking at getting investors into our plans or resources mobilized uh, for the UN to help uh, the governments or whatever. First, we need to, of course, identify the source. And I've given you some examples of the different sources and you've heard from Ludi as well, all the different sources that are already being employed. We need a strategy for engagement, negotiation, and managing and reporting to communicate results. And maybe the last slide here is to you know, remember that the product is, is very important, whether it's for the pandemic fund or whether it is indeed you know, for the plan itself. What are the priorities within it and how well have we defined the, the product and the price, if you like, for sale and the place and the promotion? And often sometimes we, we well, let's say, sometimes we find that actually costing uh, you know, through an appropriate economic analysis and supporting it with a, an appropriate return on investment uh, is missing uh, or lacking um, and could be strengthened. So I think there's a lot to be done, but just to conclude that uh, the more I think we work together and more we think outside the box in terms of the pandemic fund is not the be all and end all, it's a catalytic uh, you know, uh, grant to support a larger uh, sense of investment planning through grants and private sector and bank investment. Thanks a lot.
Great, thanks a lot, Katrin. Very, very informative. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first is, uh, what is the co-investment or co-financing to the pandemic fund? What's the recommended ratio for that? Okay, so there's not a, a set ratio, but as said in the last round um, from the proposals that were received, uh, the communication was that $1 of pandemic fund equals $6 of other co-finance, co-investment raise. But uh, uh, basically, every country we know is different. Every country uh, is more or less challenged in, in this uh, domain. And I think we, we would have to you know, look at the difference, particularly across the spread of uh, low income to more sort of you know, middle income uh, status. And of course, the more middle income status, we would expect more co-financing and hard co-investment. Thanks. Okay, great. And another question. Um, how do communities and grassroots organizations participate in the decision-making processes related to the mobilization and allocation of the pandemic funds? Well, that's a really good, it's a multi-layered question. So yes. let me say <laughs> at the board level, there are two representatives of civil society, one for civil society in the north and civil society in the south, and they speak very much to the importance of civil society engagement and, and not tokenism, but true engagement. So that's at the board level. Um, also, we have experts on the technical advisory panel that would be reviewing for the civil society engagement, stakeholder mapping and actual dialogue leading up to the design. But at country level, that you know the onus is is also on the UN for this and the implementing entities to really engage but uh, we know that we have very proactive civil society members at country level who have actually knocked on doors of government and of implementing entities and I think that's really where it all happens and should start in terms of really showing you know how civil society um you know can play a role and of course are important partners in in delivery of these projects terrific thank you very much i'm going to move now to some closing comments from you and the other presenters uh, for today and in your closing comments if you can maybe address some of the challenges experienced from your knowledge uh, during resource mapping and mobilization from countries, maybe how to quickly address those. I'll go to you first, Katrin. Okay, um, well, this is an interesting challenge, maybe provocative, is I think the, the resource mobilization and mapping is, is relatively easily done these days, you know, with the web and, and contacts and platforms at the country level. But I would say governance of who goes where and who got go, gets what. And I know our UN country teams, but beyond that, also with the government, how can we better work in harmony rather than competition? Uh, because sometimes at the last hurdle, you know, the competition actually uh, gets in the way of mobilizing together. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. I'll move backwards in our programming. I'll go next to Ludi. Closing comments. What are some challenges experienced during resource mapping and mobilization? If you could address those and some solutions. Thank you. Um, I think the challenges, I mean, country to country is very unique because resource mapping process is tailor-made for the country. Exactly the structure of the country is not going to be then, you know, general, I mean, standardized. After that, we have 20 countries. We will standardize the commonality. But I think the, the consensus building of different ministry, it is quite overwhelming in terms of uh, building them agreeing on key prioritizations because you know there are priorities that the country can, can really um, implement. Um, so it's really building the consensus among different uh, stakeholders. The second challenge is also looking at the expertise that is not only just finance, but it's also the expertise to deliver the program deliver the project. And that is, um, you know, combined and we combined it effort with the institution and partner who is providing those expertise. The BHO is a convener at the country level, at the regional level, at the global level to support. So I think those are the key challenges. And I think we need to build um, uh, those cross-sectorality much more better. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Ludi. And final comments from you, Andrea. 
Thank you very much. I would say coordination as a challenge. Um, that's probably the most because uh, many actors intervening together, as uh, I think Catherine said, it's easier to map all these resources and intervention, but then how to link them together in a coordinated way so that the investment from pandemic fund becomes valuable and relevant. That's the key question that I suggest all colleagues should address uh, in developing those proposals and looking especially to domestic commitment, which we have seen in round one has been a game changer for winners. So that would be my my closing. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Thanks a lot, Andrea. Um, thank you to all of the presenters today, Andrea, Lu uh, Andrea, sorry, Ludi and Katrin. We really appreciate your time. And thank you for the participants for joining today. Um, I wanted to notice that there have been a couple of questions that are more relevant for the pandemic funds secretariat, some specifically around complementing the implementation of the product solution proposal and some contact information. So it's best if you just go ahead and contact the Secretariat for the Pandemic Fund. My colleagues will enter the email address for you in the chat area, but it's the, T-H-E, underscore pandemic, underscore fund at worldbank.org. Again, the underscore pandemic, underscore fund at worldbank.org. Please ask those questions uh, to the Secretariat there. Okay, we have some additional resources here that we'll provide through the slide sets, et cetera, some templates um, and other supporting information. Uh, you can see it there on the slide. If you have additional questions, I think we can go to the, the next slide. You can, well, you'll see other our other webinars and series, and we have just a few more coming up uh, later this week, actually tomorrow, monitoring and review of the proposals, and then next week, finalizing the pan pandemic fund proposal. If you have additional questions, please go ahead and email us at who at WHE, that stands for WHO Health Emergencies Program, <laughs> WHESPP at WHO.INT. So please uh, send WHO related questions there. And if you have a free moment, please scan that QR code and provide us your feedback. We really appreciate it. It helps us to be able to improve future webinars. So again, thank you to our presenters today and thank you to the participants for your time. We'll see you next time. Bye.